Hi, thank you so much everyone for being patient, for being with us today. My name is Renee Hess. I am the founder and executive director of the Black Girl Hockey Club and welcome to our Juneteenth discussion on race, hockey, and community. I am so excited to do this today, even though we had about 20 minutes of technical difficulties. It's all good. We're still here. We're still showing up for the cause. Um, it's it's going to be a good time, and you're still going to get the full 60 minutes. Uh, and we are going to have Blake Bolden joining us in just a few minutes. But first, I want to introduce to you our moderator. Her name is Erica Ayala, and she has been part of the Black Girl Hockey Club family since the inception, basically. Uh, Erica is a freelance journalist. And she has written pieces for the New York Times. She has written for Title IX. And for the Ice Garden, she has a website, ericaayala.com. And you can also find her on Authorly, right? Is that the website, Authorly? Yeah, you got it. You're doing great. She um, is a Metropolitan Riveters fan. And I think her favorite player is still Blake Bolden because she wears the Blake Bolden jersey loud and proud everywhere we go. Yeah, it's right behind her on the chair. I knew it. Erica has moderated panels for us in Pittsburgh when we were there for Black Hockey History Day in February. And she has moderated a panel for us in Nashville, our very first Black Girl Hockey Club panel, uh, when we were screening Soul on Ice both times, the Kwame Mason film. If you haven't seen it, please go check it out. And she's going to talk with us today and lead out the discussion uh, along with her co-facilitator, Sydney Augustine. So I'm going to let Erica take it away. Renee, thank you so much as always for being such an important part of the hockey community. Uh, thank you for everyone that has tuned in and, and welcome. Happy Juneteenth. Happy early Father's Day. Um, and we're glad to have you here. As Renee mentioned, we want this panel to be a, a discussion. So we have the panelists, and I'll run through them shortly, but for everyone who is watching, we want you to, to be thinking about a few things and these things as we go into our discussion, because we want this to be a learning tool for all of us. Um, we really want to think about anti-racism work, but also this idea of allyship and how all of us, regardless of where we personally stand or identify, can be good allies. We want to have the panelists talk about not necessarily the experiences that they've had um, in the hockey community from their vantage point, uh, particularly being Black in hockey, but more so how we can utilize the experiences and stories that they've already shared with us and, and move the sport forward. So with that said, I'm going to introduce the panelists. So we have Ayo Ayinde, uh, Adinye, excuse me, um, and he is committed to the University of Alabama Huntsville, but got his start in hockey uh, with the Columbus Ice Hockey Club dating back to when he was three years old. So you, you, you're you not new to this, you're true to this, homie. Welcome, welcome. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs> of course. And up next, Soroya Tinker, of the Metropolitan Riveters. Uh, just had to put that out there. Uh, so Soroya comes to us. Um, she's coming into the professional ranks, but went to Yale. She is uh, not only a Riveter, but a first round draft pick in the National Women's Hockey League. And Soroya, welcome. Glad to have you on the panel. Yes, thank you for having me. <laughs> Of course, of course. We heard that Blake Bolden will be joining us. And for those of you who do not know, Blake Bolden has a number of firsts under her belt as well. Went to Boston College, won a Clarkson Cup in the Canadian Women's Hockey League with the Boston Blades. Won an Isabel Cup, the first ever Isabel Cup in the National Women's Hockey League with the Boston Pride. And now she is a scout with the Los Angeles Kings. But my personal favorite thing to add uh, is that Blake Bolden Athletics, uh, which is her business, has just released a cookbook, Eat in Color. So go check that out. That's Blake Bolden. We have our next panelist I'd like to introduce is Joel Ward has about 14 years combined of professional hockey um, experience, but 11 of those seasons in the NHL. And I uh, am 
I have some good information here that he is a a, a, a legend, a Washington DC legend. I think that's a note Fatu in particular uh, had me a place in there. And as you can see, always repping Black Girl Hockey Club. Joel, welcome to the panel. Thank you so much for joining us. And as was mentioned, we have Sydney Augustine. Now she is the founder of Sports Disrupted. Everyone go check that out on all the social meets on social media, and that is a multimedia movement to disrupt sports with honest dialogue. And we're going to learn a little bit more about Sydney as we get into things here. Renee Hess, of course, kicked us off. She is also a panelist, but Sydney, as you know, you are going to co-facilitate this with me. So now that we've run through the panel, um, we want to, again, Thank everyone for coming for this Juneteenth celebration and this Juneteenth panel as we celebrate Black culture and Black history. So Sydney, let's get it going. Let's do that hockey. <laughs> Super excited. Thank you, Erica. Um, so as we all know, we're here to celebrate Juneteenth. And often with that celebration comes a deeper reflection of um, the U.S. is um, the U.S. is um, history, long history of racism. Um, and particularly the South has a culture entrenched with racism from, come from Confederate flags to um, monuments that honor our slave owners. Um, but it's also the birthplace of the civil rights movement and many of its heroes. Interestingly enough, Ao, um, you will be playing college in the deep South this fall. So I would just love to have you share with us why you committed to the University of Alabama, Huntsville, um, and how has your hockey career and experiences, especially because you were um, in the Hockey is for Everyone program, um, how have those experiences prepared you to enter Southern hockey culture and ultimately change it? Um, one of the big reasons why I did pick the University of Alabama Huntsville is I'm from Columbus, but my parents moved to Mississippi. When they did that, I tried to find a school that was kind of close to them, mama's boy. Um, so they ended up giving me a scholarship and I, I signed my NLI there. Um, more than anything, coming from the Columbus Ice Hockey Club, trying to go down south and play hockey. I hope that I won't have any problems. I don't see myself having any problems, but um, I see the the program that I came from and the diversity that I had coming up playing hockey, bringing in a role because I actually, I will have another African-American teammate, Peyton Francis, so I won't be alone. I think it'll be a fun experience. Awesome, that's super exciting for you. Um, Soraya, you are also another, um, loud voice of the younger generation. Um, you recently graduated from Yale um, this year um, and you've been quite vocal about this current social climate um, regarding police brutality, um, protesting and just the entire Black Lives Matter movement. Um, what inspired you to use your platform as both a Black woman um, and an athlete to speak out against racial injustices um, so boldly? Yeah, I think throughout my career, I wasn't necessarily as comfortable speaking out, but in my junior and senior year, I became more comfortable and, and wanted to talk about those issues and call my teammates out and, and make an effort to educate others. So I think that's why I've used my voice and, and just been a big, big voice in, in the Black Hawk community, as well as like for Black female athletes as well. I think it's super powerful. That's really great. Um, and... Also, Joel, Joel um, you are from quite a different generation, but you have been extremely supportive of Black Girl Hockey Club, and you were also named to the executive committee of the recently formed Hockey Diversity Alliance, um, which was announced last week. Um, can you just share with us what the Hockey Diversity Alliance is and what are some of the goals you are hoping to um, accomplish through the alliance? Oh, you're muted. <laughs> Damn generation, sorry. Uh, we, we founded the Hockey Diversity Alliance, the HDA. There was uh, seven of us that got together. Um, <clears throat> throughout our careers, we've all experienced and uh, observed racism. So uh, we wanted to try to end that and try to combat that uh, and, and racism in our game and our sport and even in society. So 
we're just trying to do our part and and you know my main reason for uh black girl hockey club is my mother growing up she was uh she always said that she wished there was a group for her to kind of join on uh, while I was playing. So uh, the group holds dearly to my heart because there's a lot of times my mother is in the stands and in seats by herself and where she couldn't kind of relate or talk to. So to go through some of the experiences. So, uh, you know, I'm a big fan, of course, and it really uh, means a lot. Thank you for that, Joel. Um, that's a really touching um, story with your mother. Um, but one of the things that I and many people realized um, when the statement for the Hockey Diversity and Alliance was released was that there were no women of color named on the statement. Um, what is the HDA currently doing right now to ensure membership is inclusive to all people of color, including women and the LBGTQ plus community? Well, in our, in our statement, we've always included diversity and inclusion for everybody. So obviously we're gonna need women to uh to combat this especially in diversity in the game of hockey we know that when we first came our, our group our group's been talking together for since like november on and off um we've had a few chats and we just had to uh come to form as our group we once we kind of start, started talking about things and started facilitating going through little different avenues and and so who do we talk to we just said hey we got to start here and uh you know for us it's obviously to find a way and find some initiatives that we can to uh you know, eradicate racism in, in our in our sport and in society. So, um, but we're we're open to everybody. We're we're not discriminating anybody. We just had to start somewhere here with the group that we had, and then we're we're. But trust me, we're we love everybody. We're gonna need everybody. We're gonna need the strength. We're gonna need that power. We're gonna need everybody on board to in order to make change. And that's what we're here all about. So, uh, we're not discriminating anybody. As I said, we're we're open the door for everybody. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate that. And we're looking forward to Hockey Diversity Alliance growing. Um, I'm going to shift the conversation a little bit. Um, I know I have three amazing um, hockey players of color on this panel. Um, and something that I have noticed recently with a lot of hockey players of color being so vocal about the racism that they experience, um, particularly in a key Aliou's article, Hockey is for Everyone, um, Hockey is Not for Everyone, um, where he detailed the racism he experienced in hockey, um, he went on to mention how he sort of internalized that racism and it pushed him to be a better hockey player and essentially fight for his right to play um, on the ice though. Um, and my question for all three of you, whoever would like to go first, is do you feel like you um, internalized racism throughout your career and kind of used it to channel your feelings and push you to be a better player on the ice. So essentially just getting a final say on the ice and not confronting the racism directly. Um, and the second question of that is, how do you feel that has affected you mentally? Um, who I would like to go first. Um, I'll, I'll jump in since for he's just, Akeem's obviously a, a big member of our HDA. So, um, but to, the racism that I've experienced, um, it was it was fuel for me. I, you know, the things that people have said to me during games from all levels, from kids. I remember growing up, I mean, I've had some incidents. I, play, I played many minor hockey tournaments. I have kids call me names. I had no idea what they even meant. But, you know, I'd always come home complaining, crying. But my mother always said, don't worry about it. You know, they're just jealous because you're better than them. And I just use that as motivation for me growing up. I mean, half the terms I'd even know. As I got older... I mean, even playing National Hockey League games, I'd be in stands, I'd be, I'd be skating around the rink and, and go back to Africa, go back, do this, do that, go play basketball. So I've been called everything. And for me, it was two things. I think for one, it was education for my teammates. To, this is the, some of the stuff that I go through on a day to day. So some of them, we've always had some chats, but for me, it was just more fuel to say, hey, to prove myself, uh, to prove that I was a good hockey player, I deserved to be here, and I was here to excel, and and that's what I kind of used uh, moving forward. So, but also for my teammates, it was a learning curve and the stuff that I went through in 2012 in Boston. Um, you know, for 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 guys that did not, for people that wanted me dead for scoring a hockey goal. I mean, come on. So to have conversations with my teammates and have them understand was to me was I took it was a big positive for me on the outlook of things. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, would Soroy like to go next? Yeah, I think for me, um, throughout my career, I just, 
it was always like in one ear out the other um let it be fuel that's what my dad always said and and I did up until a point um where I was in college and I just I started to hate the game I I didn't want to go to the rink anymore um I wasn't enjoying playing and and I just found myself not succeeding to the point that that I had previously um which was so upsetting just because I I did love the game but just didn't like the white space at the rink um, and that's why I think I decided to start stepping up and speaking up in my my upperclassmen years and, and call my teammates out and talk to Yale Athletic Department and and talk to them about how they can um, improve their diversity inclusion training and stuff like that. Um, but I think for me, it, it did make me hate the game. And I, I will admit, like, I still do have some of those feelings and, and I am nervous to play professionally and, and whatnot. But I also know that I am a strong voice now and, and I'm not going to put up with that stuff. So. You definitely are. Thank you, Soraya. <laughs> um, my experiences were more um, disappointing than anything, but I did use them as fuel. It was more, as Soraya said, in one ear, out the other. But um, it was difficult sometimes. I even had situations where my own teammates would say some stuff. And it was, I always tried to pride myself on being a good teammate, but it was hard sometimes. Um, I really feel that it has helped push me, though, because I just want to prove all of them wrong. Everyone, I'm a 6'5 African-American. Everyone says I should be playing basketball. So prove them wrong, try to make it to the NHL, and just laugh in their face afterwards. So. Thank you. Hi, Blake. Welcome. It's great to have you. Hi. Um, so we're just, oh, you're muted. <laughs> all right. Am I there? Yes. All right. Um, so we're just discussing um, how often hockey players of color, when they have expressed the racism that they have experienced um, throughout um, their careers, that often they internalize that racism and they use it more as a fuel to push them um, and to perform better on the ice. And I was just wondering if personally for you, have you um, use racism to fuel your talent um, and how has that affected you mentally? Absolutely. Uh, when I was younger, I started playing voice hockey, AAA, and uh, some of the parents were pretty outrageous in the stands. A lot of my, my mom and my dad heard a lot, specifically because my dad was white and he would hear things that the parents wouldn't think that, you know, they were talking about his daughter. Um, I would hear my parents talking about what the kids said, um, when they were alone, and I would internalize that. I'd feel pretty crappy, um, but on the ice, uh, once I got the respect from my boys' teammates, they would back me up, and that felt really good, but some of the kids would say cruel things, especially, you know, because I was the only girl and because I was the only black person on the ice usually. It stunk, and it actually quite ticked me off, so I definitely used that as fuel um, and I always wanted to prove myself against the boys. So I had to buck up and just let that roll off my sleeves because nothing was going to stop me from playing and just being physical because I loved it so much. And it definitely helped. Thank you for sharing that. Um, another follow-up question to that is um, using that as fuel and not really directly confronting the racism, unlike what's happening right now with everything, um, people are having open conversations and sitting down and talking more. Um, how has, yes, the current climate been for you actually having open conversations with your teammates and actually talking and saying, this happened to me and this is how I feel, um, unlike before, um, just like kind of brushing it off sort of thing. Right. Um, it's definitely comforting. People like Soraya and are stepping up and, and saying their story, and that's really helpful. Uh, when I was coming up, I was one of the first to do it, and it was a little, I felt quieted. I felt like if I were to speak up a lot, I'd be the angry black woman in the room, in the locker room. I, I too, wanted to be a good teammate, um, so I definitely let microaggressions slip by. And then going home and being like, dang, like this white sport, like is really chipping out at me. Um, but after a while, I uh, gained some confidence within myself to speak up in the locker room. Not all the time, but definitely when I felt that my feelings were hurt or that something was inappropriate. Um, I definitely developed the confidence to say some things. But with, with everything that's happening now, I'm so glad that people are educating themselves. Teammates are reaching out to me. 
of all different races supporting the movement and educating themselves on what's going on within our sport and obviously what's going on in the country. That's amazing. Yes, it's really great that people are having these conversations. And I kind of want to follow up with that. I know you mentor young girls. So how has this movement or the social current social climate inspired you um, um, in helping the younger generation that you're working with now? Yeah, well, it's it's nice because background. So I've had the conversation about how they're feeling and what their views are, and myself just being open to their their background and their experiences. And a lot of them are appalled by what's going on, which is comforting. And the black individuals that I do mentor are opening them up, up about their stories and what they've gone through and what makes them uncomfortable. And I feel like at this point, I'm able to kind of talk them through it and say, hey, well, why don't you become a leader and be more confident and say what you think should be right in the locker room and change the climate? Because what happens is we need to change it at a younger age so that as everyone's growing up, it's, it's just a part of the norm to be a good human being and not to be unjust in the things that you're saying. Yes. Thank you so much for that, Blake. Um, that's so true. It's so important to have these conversations with the younger generation. Um, and I would love to bring Renee in. Um, you are the founder of BGHC, but you also have a background in academia. And I would just love to know why are these conversations and having these spaces for dialogue so important? You know, honestly, to touch on what Blake just said, you know, she was talking about uh, being perceived as the angry black woman in the locker room and and allowing microaggressions to kind of slide. And I would say that a, a lot of black folks can relate to that feeling um, in your workplace, in your place of worship, it, you know, in many facets of our lives, we, we let microaggression slide and we don't have the conversation because we're scared of being perceived as the angry black person. You know, we're scared of, um, you know, pulling the race card uh, and making everything about race. When in reality, we have to have these conversations in order to move forward in, in our sport, in our society, uh, in our communities. And so, you know, one of the, my biggest passions is bringing communities together, building communities so that we can have these conversations, so that we are feeling comfortable enough to share our stories and to, you know, learn and educate one another. Because if we continue to stay silent, then, you know, the younger generation are the ones that suffer. And so, you know, I, that's why I love having the, the voices of, you know, Soroya and Ayo and you, Sydney, because you are the, the ones that are going to help pull us out of this, uh, this um, racist system that we, we see happening in not just in society, but in our own little society, in our own little hockey society, right? Um, sports are a reflection of what goes on in the world. And, you know, people who say keep politics out of sports are privileged enough to be able to keep politics out of sports. Uh, as a Black woman, I'm not privileged in, in that way. I cannot keep politics out of any aspect of my life because the color of my skin is political. And so, you know, these types of conversations are so important. Education, educating ourselves, um, allies, educating yourselves is so important because we have to learn how to move past and to bring ourselves, you know, bring our country and our sport out of this systemic racism that we're steeped in. Thank you so much for that, Renee. That is so insightful and I share a lot of the same sentiments as you. Um, thank you to all the panelists. I'm gonna switch it over to Erica now. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Sydney. I appreciate you being willing to um, walk through this and you and I we kind of have a, a unique position as media and as media who are dedicated to uplifting voices uh, such as all of our amazing panelists but for you Sydney I'm, I'm curious to offer to the audience um, what if 
it can, or what your hope is when you say really disrupting sports media, what does that mean for you in the context of everything that we have heard already on the panel, but also what we're seeing um, play out on the worldwide stage right now? Um, for me, disrupting means having these open conversations and dialogues. I have, um, going back to what Renee said about people often trying to keep politics out of sports, saying politics don't exist in sports. Um, they do exist in sports because sports is a social institution. Um, so what happens in society is happening in sports. Um, a prime example is COVID-19. Um, people are trying to bring back sports and now you're finding out that all these players um, are, have been diagnosed with COVID. Um, so I think for me, disruption is people for making that connection that sports and society, they're not two separate entities, but they actually work together. Um, and ultimately when people make that connection, they feel more inclined um, as either fans or either as um, athletes on the panel or as just sports professionals that people who work in the sports industry find their voice um, and feel inclined to be activists, that they're, they realize that I'm human first and humanity is important. Um, and that needs to come first before any sports or any form of athleticism. And I'd like to bring Ayo and Soroy into this conversation as well, because you know we were talking a little before we went live, like really, really live. But um, we, we were talking about uh, that perhaps and you all are roughly in the same generation, that things look a little bit different in the landscape of sport just in general. It froze. But, uh oh. Yeah. Can you hear me though? We can hear you, Erica. Okay, great. Io, Io froze up though. Oh, okay. Well, the question that I wanted to ask again to Io, Soroya, and also to Sydney is. What would you like to see this younger generation be able to, to take on as far as having a real open conversation about being supportive, uh, certainly to the Black community, but also, if we're being honest, for the Black community also to be supportive of, of each other in all its facets and be able to then um, extend that to other ways that people identify specifically in the hockey space. So I maybe we'll start with you. I'm sorry to tell you, I froze. I have no idea what you said. <laughs> Fair enough. So we won't start with you. Soraya, uh, are you still there? Can I'll repeat the question. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll okay. repeat the question. So I, I was talking that you, Sydney, and Soraya are roughly from the same generation. And we're having uh, conversations, particularly about race, that seem to be very different than they have been in the past. And I, I also get this in, impression that a younger generation, because of even things like social media or video conferencing, that conversations can happen more rapidly than in the past. I, I'd like to know what you'd like to see um, and, and how you'd like to be a part of that, that culture change um, and, and how you'd like to also be able to extend that allyship throughout the Black community and to other communities that maybe you don't personally identify with. Okay. Um... More than anything, I would say that being able to use my platform and my space is extremely helpful because of some of the situations I've been in with some of my old teammates uh, from putting stuff on my Instagram story and them coming back saying, I didn't know that, that type of thing, gaining allies that way, even talking ever since it's kind of more acceptable to talk about everything that's happened. I've talked to a couple of my teammates that did say some ignorant racist stuff to me. And one of them even typed me like a three page apology letter talking about why what he did was incorrect, that type of thing. So like, I think that it's really important to just use your platform when you have it now because it's social media, you can just pick up your phone and see it every day. So. And Soraya, how about you? Um, yeah, I think for me, it's been very helpful having some of my teammates reach out to me as well. Um, and, and express their lack of understanding and, and express that they, they know that they're wrong in, in the things that they've said to me. Um, and then also just 
continuing to educate. So I know I've talked to my Gale coach and, and he, he's definitely very open-minded and wants to learn more and, and wants to find ways that he can include um, Kirsten Good, who is, oh, she'll be a sophomore next year. Um, so I know that my team, my previous teammates have been making an effort to include her and stuff like that. So I think the education part for me and using my platform in that sense has been huge. Um, posting educational posts, um, giving people reading lists, podcasts, movies, books, so, uh, lists and read and, and whatnot. So I think that's why um, that's been the most important thing for me. And then I'd like to cycle back to both of you. Has that also changed how you have thought about your own practice of allyship and what you can do to make sure that hockey is supportive of, again, all communities? Yeah, I think I've realized that I do have a voice and that people do listen. Um, I think that I've received so much positive feedback. It's, it's very easy to ignore the negative, but um, – I think that it, it showed me that, that people do want to listen and they do want to learn. And that's so encouraging just because I haven't necessarily felt that energy from my teammates. Oh, and she's gone. But um, I'll, I'll jump in from there. I'll say the same thing. It was, it is extremely, um, extremely encouraging when you are able to talk to people and they want to listen and it's even encouraging to me because I feel I am educated but whenever I spread education to other people I just want to get more education that I can give to people so I just I think it's an extremely extremely great blessing to be able to be able to use social media and to reach out to 3,000 4,000 people a day just to be able to express your opinions and it's always great being able to get stuff off your chest not having to hold it in, just being able to express yourself and tell people what's actually going on. Yeah, and Joel, I'd like to bring you into this conversation because you wore a Black Girl Hockey Club uh, hoodie shirt to an event and were able to uplift Black Girl Hockey Club to maybe people who weren't familiar or hadn't um, done or hadn't been able to come in contact with the work that Renee has been doing. Again, the similar question to you, after that experience and seeing the impact, um, you know, what did, what would you like people to, to be able to learn about allyship and the practice of allyship um, from that experience that you had? You know, right off the hop from that experience is, um, I've had hockey mothers, black hockey mothers reach out to me. Um, just showing the support. I think the representation is what's huge. I think just wearing the sweater alone and letting people know that, you know, being at the rink is a safe place to be, um, to encourage that. And, you know, for other parents that are going through it, moms and dads, uh, to know that, you know, our children deserve to play the game as well and to be in a safe place. But the response I got was um, from people calling me, emailing me, I had no idea, to be honest with you. But a lot of parents that reached out just from wearing the sweater alone, um, and I could relate with my own mother, as I said earlier. So, um, you know, I, it it would have been nice back in the day. My mother, I, <laughs> I know I keep bringing it up, but I, you know, um, she's a big hockey fan. But again, I think the, you know, it's just having that res- representation, I think is going to be huge. And, and as more parents are getting more comfortable and, and more people and more people of color um, being around the game and, and having their children playing, it's, it's going to be um by the end of the day, we're, yeah, we're going to be winning for sure. Renee, I'd love to uh, tap you in here because you get to hear and see all of the amazing ways that Black Girl Hockey Club has been able to impact those on the panel, um, whether it's opportunities uh, that lead to scouting jobs or you know opportunities to share their story. I think it's been great. But I... I I imagine, Renee, that there is also some conversations that you have where there are people that generally don't understand, perhaps, just by the name Black Girl Hockey Club, mm-hmm. where that intersectionality lies. I'd, I'd love for you to, to tackle that as far as, um, you know, what led you to name Black Girl Hockey Club just that? And, and um, what are some of the ways, though, that you do try to incorporate intersectional um, conversations? Well, you know, I wanted to name the Black Girl Hockey Club what it is, because first and foremost, this is a space for Black women. And But, you know, if you look at our website or and our mission statement, we lead off with that, but we also say, and for our friends, and for our family, and for our allies. Um, So this is a space for Black women, 
to feel safe and but you don't have to be a black woman to be part of the space you just have to be able to accept the fact that this is our space and and if you are in our space then you are here because you're an ally and because you're a friend and you're part of our family because all of us you know, have non-Black friends and non-Black non -black family and non-Black allies that we need to rely on in order to be able to make this whole anti-racism work happen. We cannot just do it on our own. On our own. Um, black folks cannot just, you know, we, we don't just live in a bubble. We're not a monolith. We, we need to be able to um, expand this conversation outside of the Black community. But in terms of the hockey world, it's such, you know, Soroya had mentioned um, the arena being such a white space. And, you know, um, if you're a black person or a person of color, you probably, and, and you're a hockey fan, you've probably gone into the rink and played, like, count the black people or, or count the people of color. And, you know, um, I, that's, that was one of the whole reasons I started the Black Girl Hockey Club, because I would go to hockey games and I would never see other black women that were there to enjoy the game. They were there, you know, working in the arena, you know, selling uh, food and work by, you know, getting tickets, but they weren't there to enjoy the game because the space in itself is a, a non-black space. And so the, the reason I wanted to call Black Girl Hockey Club what it is, it was to put it out there for the world to know that this is a safe space in hockey for Black women. You don't have to be Black. You don't have to be a woman. You don't have to be, you know, you, you can be whoever you are and be part of the BGHC family. We're an intersectional community. We, you know, we lift up all marginalized communities. That is the entire purpose of Black Girl Hockey Club. But ultimately, this is a space for Black women. And so as long as my sisters are feeling safe and comfortable and uh, as if they have a, a space for them, then, you know, anybody and everybody is welcome to, to join us. Uh, and, you know, I am all about making this an intersectional space that is safe for everyone who wants to be in it um and i think you know going back to what joel said about the diversity alliance i kind of feel that that same vibe from from that you know we want to make sure that our brothers and sisters of color are able to find a space for themselves in hockey but we do need our allies. We do need our non-Black friends. We do want our LGBTQ plus family to, to be in this space for us because, you know, we're, we're not free until we're all free, right? And so that's, that's what Black Girl Hockey Club is all about. So Renee, I've asked you from your personal experience with Black Girl Hockey Club, but I think there is still this balance or at least a conversation, this back and forth conversation that we're seeing play out as there are lots of, of peaceful protests and, and um, gatherings to elevate Black Lives Matter. And now we're starting to see that there's also a focus that all Black Lives Matter, as you mentioned, the Black community mm -hmm. not being a monolith. I, I want to rely on your academic experience and just being even in a space of academia. You know, um, how, how do you think we, as, as the collective Black Girl Hockey Club community, can help find that balance of, as you said, making sure that we are focused on our experience and why it is important for black women, um, black girls and women to, to be able to be supported, but then also what that support can look like when we offer it to others. You know, one thing that I've been noticing with the um, protests going on across the, the nation, across the world, is that so many of these movements are led by black women. And, you know, black women are, I would say, the cornerstone of the black community. Um, you know, Joel's talking about his mom and her experiences. We're talking about our own personal experiences and those of our, you know, our sisters and our, our friends. And to be able to uplift the black woman, you know, um, the most disrespected person in America, to be able to have a space to uplift the black women 
we're not going to leave anybody behind. That's what we do as black women. You know, we, we're uplifting our, our black brothers. We're uplifting our LGBTQ plus uh, friends and family. We're uplifting our, our non-black allies because that's what black women do. And so it is a fine line. And it's a question that I have, I get, you know, on a regular basis. Well, I'm not black. Can I join the black girl hockey club? I'm not a girl. Can I join the black girl hockey club? And my answer to that is, you know, if you support us, yes, of course, please. Um, because, you know, you know, the, the, saying from the film 13th, uh, I can't remember the person who, who actually put it out there, but I've seen it a lot on protest signs and um, just the idea that all lives cannot matter until Black lives matter. And I would pose, you know, all Black lives must matter before all lives can matter, right? And and Black women are are going to be the leaders of the revolution. Let's go. Let's do it. That's what we're, you know, we're built for this. You know, we're, we're built for this. I see Blake and Eric. Yeah, we're built for this. Come on. That's what we do. We, we overcome the adversities within our own communities. And we take that strength outside of our communities to, to, you know, we're not here to be mammies. We're not here to fix your problems, but we're here to lead. And, and, um, one of you, I think it was Blake, you were talking about, you know, making leaders from, from the, the young age group so that we can, you know, start these systemic changes when they're, you know, before junior hockey, right? I mean, we, we saw the, the articles coming out this week about the atrocities going on in junior hockey, and we need to fix that before it even starts. We need to fix that with the kids. And, you know, I mean, it's not something that they learn on their own. It's something that they learn from society, from their parents, from their friends, from their teachers. It's insidious. Racism is insidious. And it is intrinsic to most of our institutions, all of our institutions. And so we've got to start young and we've got to be loud and brave because this is lifelong work. This isn't, a, you know, Black Lives Matter month. <laughs> you know, this isn't just a, a week or I saw somewhere on the Internet saying that this isn't Black Lives Matter Spirit Week. You know, we've got to keep it moving. We've got to keep it going. And I think conversations, groups, communities like Black Girl Hockey Club are, are a way to start that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I know Fatsu is here. I just want to offer to her if, there, if we're seeing any comments that you want to shift over to me or to Sydney. Uh, if there are any questions, let us know. But uh, to that point, Renee, I want to go to Blake because you and I were able to be part of a conversation. Um, and she, uh, <laughs> we are, uh, every time I, I cue to someone, their, their video comes up. But uh, <laughs> hey, Blake. <laughs> What's up, girl? You know, I'm living good. I'm living good. But, uh, you know, you you and I were part of a conversation with number, another member of the hockey community, Ali Thunstrom. And what I liked about that conversation is I think that all of us took away something that we then have tried to practice. And for you, I think what I found illuminating was that you have just started to, to feel more comfortable and confident sharing uh, your own personal experience and, and you shared resources and, and it seems that you've continued to do that. Um, you know, what has this been like for you and, and what are some of the things that now you're plugged into that are allowing you to continue to, um, you know, exercise that muscle? Yeah, well, man, well, yesterday was Juneteenth and I just had so much excitement because that's just, our black July 4th, that is our day to celebrate. And I hadn't really celebrated in years prior, like I did yesterday. You know, I watched black films, I ate African food, I joined a group of beautiful black women outside playing music in a park that was just in it was just so many people that were together and not really protesting, but just just speaking the word. And just seeing everybody's positivity and push around the Black community is really inspirational. And it's given me the strength, as Renee said, you know, Black women are strong and we need to push this forward. 
And so for me, it's been like a weight lifted off of my shoulder. It's like, oh my gosh, I'm not just the first black woman. I can say things now, you know, when I could have said them before, but I feel good about it now. I feel like there's support, there is push, there's excitement and it's, it's relieving. And I feel that I want to educate my friends and the people that are asking me as Allie was just so open to educating herself. And I felt like I needed to do that as her friend and as a black woman who wants to push information to those who have been in the shadows and, and not knowing what, what everyone should know. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, maybe drop some, some of that knowledge uh, with our, with our oh. friends here. What, was, well, what are some of the things that are, have been your favorite to watch? Well, yesterday I watched Harriet, which, oh my gosh, if anybody is, hasn't watched that movie, you need to watch it immediately. It's obviously about Harriet Tubman and her work in just being relentless in freeing slaves, even after she had freed herself in traveling hundreds of miles. So to me, that was inspirational. And another point to say, hey, Black women are doing things, and they have been doing things over hundreds of years. Um, I am a huge proponent of watching 13th and watching and listening and understanding the systematic racism and unjust incarceration within our Black community and why it's happening. I think it's not just talking about it's happening, it's understanding why it's happening. It's understanding that, you know, as black people, we are fueling this system. So we are putting everything on our back, just like we've been putting things on our back since we were stolen from our country and our continent to be brought over here to build a country. We are constantly putting things on our back. And so as allies, we have to share that. We have to share that and educate people and say, hey, take this off my back, put it on your back so we can all come up together. Um, so that's kind of what I'm doing. I'm just trying to spread the love, spread the spread the knowledge. I don't know everybody and know everything. I'm not a historian. I'm just a black woman doing my job and educating myself. So everybody should be doing the same thing. I love that. I, I see you nodding your head. I'm curious also um, whether it's Juneteenth as Blake said, or just some other things that have really helped you um, be a part of this ongoing conversation that you think uh, are important for other people to plug into as well? I don't know. Just Juneteenth, I feel empowered me and just, I, I love the change that's happening more than anything. I like watching, like, I watched Malcolm X, uh, Who Killed Malcolm X yesterday. I watched the Malcolm X movie. I watched, uh, what was it, Selma. Like, I was just, I was in depth in my Black history yesterday. There's nothing that I love more than Black history. So it's just, listening to other people talk about it and other people actually understanding what's happening. It's just, it's empowering and it, it feels really nice. I love that. Thank you. Sydney, let me cut over to you. Um, again, you are someone who not only in undergrad, but now you're getting ready to go into an NYU program that you yourself have designed. And I think there's a, a, a also a slant or a, a frame of, of uh, health and wellness that uh, you want to add to that. So what are some things that you are plugged into and, and how are they helping you to continue the conversation? Um, so yes, I am going to grad school this um, fall to NYU. Um, my concentration is transforming the narrative, engaging the black community in critical media literacy um, to improve physical health and wellness. And essentially with that, I think media literacy is so important. I think there's so much information out there already, um, general information about racism, anti-racism resources. Um, I personally created um, resources for anti-racism in sports, um, but I think it's also really important to know what kind of information you're getting, um, how you're processing that, um, what's fact and what's fake news, um, and also when it comes to the wellness part, especially for the black community is when engaging in all this information, it can sometimes be really traumatic, right? To learn our history, to learn the things that um, the people before us went through. And I 
really encourage self-care. Um, I think that's been one of, one of the big things I'm always talking about. Like, take the day off. Like, it's okay not to, like, argue with someone on social media and, like, just be by yourself or it's okay, you know, to, like, engage in Netflix and not watch, you know, 13th or not watch when they see us. I think it's really important, especially for the Black community, to be knowledgeable, to know and be informed, but also taking care of ourselves um, because a lot of this information we already know. <laughs> um, and it's important to like educate others and be well informed ourselves. Um, but I think a lot of this information is really for other non Black folk. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you so much, Sydney. Joel, I want to come over to you because as a part of the, the Hockey Diversity Alliance, it's my understanding that. You all have had communication with Colin Kaepernick, who, um, after the WNBA players, uh, he was, of course, uh, a person who, who would kneel, um, or it turned into kneeling, I should say. And I think a lot of the conversation around Colin Kaepernick is focused on almost everything but what his original intention was. And I'm going to use uh, this conversation, Joel, to also go to a, a question Fatu sent over to us. So coming from that hockey alliance, thinking about in the hockey community, and again, having conversations with Colin Kaepernick, you know, what, what would you like to see the hockey world do to specifically address the issue of police brutality and racial profiling um, by law enforcement? Um, and, and this person also asks, kind of given the, given the way we see cop culture, uh, permeate through society? I think, uh, going back to first uh, Colin Kaepernick, um, you know, I, I think, well, first, we were kind of all in shock and surprise that he came on, to be honest with you, and share his story. Uh, it was really inspirational what he kind of, how his movement, how he started, and how he created. I think just sharing that knowledge with us was, um, you know, words are hard to describe. I mean, he, he, he laid it all out for us and just kind of gave us a breakdown. It was, it was very powerful. Um, to see him and he and he's still fighting to this day and I think from back when three years ago I think 2016-17 when he came out and he was um, doing his thing he kind of just said nobody wanted to join on with me uh, he had a few allies but at the time it was kind of a hard struggle for him but you know for the guys that did stick around like Eric Reed, uh, Malcolm Jenkins and a few others that they they stayed unified and that was kind of what he told us throughout this whole process is, you know, to stick together and to uh, believe in one another and stay strong. And that's what we kind of took, um, kind of took from his message there. Um, going to your second part of it is to me is education. I think, you know, I think the league, especially in hockey and hockey Canada, hockey USA, uh, NHL, all leagues across have got to, got to take part in doing their education when it comes to black and minority hockey players. And I know a focal point is when you're having that. I've had many chats with our security, head of security in, uh, in D.C., Officer Rice, great man. Um, and he's always willing to learn. We've always had great conversations. But to bridge in that gap is going to have that community to kind of come together. And it's not about necessarily just um, high-fiving games after, after high-fiving guys after a locker room per se, but actually having dialogue and, and for the league to understand some of the things that we go through and for, for police to kind of come in and understand what, what we're going through as well. And to bridge that gap, we're going to have continued dialogue, but for us is to educate them, let them know what's happening. And, you know, we got enforced, and part of the HDA is to uh, enforce policies. You know, I think that was one of the reasons why we, we uh, wanted to kind of keep uh, somewhat independent, uh, but working with anybody. We didn't want to be tied up to any organization or leagues because we want to hold people to account accountability. And that's going to be in order to make change. We think that was imperative. And I'd like to follow up there. Fatu is doing a great job. And thank you, everyone, for submitting some questions. Uh, Joel, folks are curious. We have 31 uh, active teams with a, with a roster, and, and Seattle will be number 32. You mentioned having the HDA be independent. Uh, mm -hmm. What are some things from that policy perspective that you were just talking about that you'd really like to see teams take on? And what ways – are you hoping to engage with teams moving forward? Yeah, we have, uh, we, we jot down quite a few, but uh, just to give you a couple, uh, you know, one was um, before every season, for example, in the uh, National Hockey League, we always go through a drug protocol, social media. Um, well, we want to implement, you know, we want to implement discussions and educating on racism. 
Uh, that's something where we would like to get around to passing around the whole team, the leagues, also uh, Hockey Canada. I think it's going to be imperative Hockey USA um, for for them to before season start during the seasons always to have. There's going to be an education seminar process. Um, coaches, I mean, obviously we know about Akeem's story, which, oh my goodness. Um, but um, I think that's imperative as well. There's a coaching clinic I was just on Lao last week. Um, to have one of those panels to dis- for a more education discussion on racism, um, to make them aware. And also they got to be, uh, you know, go through like a certificate kind of seminar. They got to go through a process. So we're, we're, we've got a, a few ideas, um, I think, Again, it's a lot about stemming from the minor hockey, the grassroots when it comes to the coaching um, and involvement. We also want to include more people in like in those big organizations as again uh, with Hockey USA, Hockey Canada of uh, be more inclusive in jobs, making it a priority to be hiring minorities and blacks in, within their offices, uh, not just being coaches, but other areas that they could uh, or other areas that they can be uh, helpful. I think as black hockey players, I thought we were undervalued. I thought we could have uh, brought more to the table, I think, on all aspects, from education, from the business aspect, too, from, um, you know, I thought just having us more out there, more visible, more representation, I thought would be huge and imperative for even for kids to, to see um, and to, for them to be more engaged in the playing. So, uh, again, we have a lot of – Great. Uh, we have quite a few different policies. I want to sit here all day and, and bore you guys to death, but uh, no, but those are just a couple of examples that, that we were kind of hoping to, to touch base on and, and hopefully that we can uh, have a few meetings coming up here and, and keep continuing to make, keep making progress. Absolutely. And Joel, you mentioned policies and, and thinking about even leadership structures. So Roy, I'd like to tap you in here because you were able to take some of that education that we've heard a lot of other panelists talk about and also activate your following to think about organizations, Black Girl Hockey Club being one of them, um, that they can be supportive of. And you you put out a challenge for folks to um, make a donation and you actually facilitated that. Um, so outside of Black Girl Hockey Club, I know Equal Justice Initiative was one of the organizations. And for those who may not know, that was founded by Brian Stevenson. He wrote the book, Just Mercy, which now I believe is a film. Um, But Soroya, thinking about the Equal Justice Initiative in particular, that is an organization that focuses on education, but also tries to funnel their activities also into policy and criminal justice. Uh, What can you tell us uh, about uh, the Equal Justice Initiative and why you felt that at this time that was a good program to highlight? Yeah, I think it was just one of the most powerful ones that spoke out to me. Um, and then also the Loveland um, Foundation, all of the organizations that I chose to donate to were definitely close to my heart and and definitely I knew could would make an impact um, in the community. So I think that's why I decided to donate to those uh, three specific ones. But um, I definitely think it's important for other people to reach and support other businesses as well. So. You. And going off of that, Renee, I'd like to, to tap you in as well, thinking about what we've heard, uh, particularly Joel and Soroya say, um, as someone who, again, comes from that world of academia, and again, again, from what I know of Black Girl Hockey Club, is really trying to facilitate conversations that include um, presentations to the NHL on, on how to be better um, supporters of their Black players and the, the Black and multicultural community. You know, what would you like to see these types of organizations in the uh, the NHL, the foundations they work with, you know, how would you like to see them be able to shift some of their concentration and even resources uh, to some of the topics that we've been talking about on this panel? You know, um, and Erica, I know you know what I'm going to say already, but my number one, you know, um, advice is to hire Black women at all levels. And I saw, I was kind of looking through the YouTube chat and I saw that comment as well. We need to hire people of color if we want to address that audience. We cannot just have the same old, same old anymore. The audience is shifting and which means the demographics of the company need to shift as well. And so hiring people of color, LGBTQ um, and various minority communities in all levels of hockey from the front office to uh, behind the bench to chefs 
to, you know, trainers and, and all of the above. So that those communities are represented when players, non-black players walk into the rink. Whenever we have that physical represent, representation, we can see somebody who looks like us. We can imagine ourselves doing it. And, you know, I, as everyone was talking, I was kind of thinking ahead to the next time where Black Girl Hockey Club has a conversation like this planned. And actually, I'm really excited because I reached out to the Carolina Hurricanes and asked them if they wanted to kind of do something like this, have a conversation with me. Uh, the Carolina Hurricanes hosted Black Girl Hockey Club uh, during Black History Month in February. Seems like a million years ago, uh, but it was about three, four months ago that we were in in Raleigh to see a Canes game, and I was really impressed with uh, the, their commitment to engaging the Black community in Raleigh. And so I'm excited to uh, hopefully and planning a conversation with um, the Canes assistant general manager of PNC Arena. His name is Larry Perkins. He's a Black man, and he's been working in um, sports management. And I was reading some of the articles about him in which he was saying, you know, that was basically an industry where there was no black people. And one thing that I loved about going uh, when I was down in Raleigh is that we got to connect with two of the HBCUs there, um, AT&T and North Carolina University, I think that was the one. And um, we got to talk to some of the sports management black students that were into sports management who had never heard or been to a hockey game before. And at the end of the game, we were able to have spent some time on the ice. Some of them had never been on the ice before. They were really, some of them were really nervous. Some of them were really excited to get out there. And the conversations that we had at the end of the night were, um, you know, how can I get involved? All of a sudden, you know, hockey is on their purview when, you know, they were spending time in university talking about basketball and football. And all of a sudden now hockey is in their city and on their purview and they're excited about it. And that's what I want to see. I want to see black folks on in all levels from sports media like Sydney and Erica to, you know, uh, mentoring like uh, Blake and um, Joel are doing to using your platform like Io and Sydney. Sydney or Soroya are doing, um, just taking that time to to engage in hockey on all levels. Uh, that's that's what I think is going to be the ultimate game changer. And in terms of resources, you know, I really think that all the hockey organizations, the big ones, uh, the National Hockey League, uh, the Women's League, USA Hockey, Hockey Canada. It needs to be from the inside out. You know, we it cannot just be lip service. It's, you know, I saw uh, one of my one of my friends in the chat. She said it's a it's a movement, not a moment, right? This is this is a movement. We have to keep it moving, and it's going to take all of us, you know, infiltrating our own little corners of hockey in order to to make that change. And what, one of you said something that kind of like depressed me a little bit. I think it was Soroya when you said it, it feels a little more acceptable to speak about race right now. And that makes me sad that we cannot normally speak about r racial issues in our businesses, in our, you know, in our sport, in our, in our work places because it's not acceptable uh that to me is unacceptable that we're not allowed to speak on our own experiences for fear of making people uncomfortable um i'm here to say get uncomfortable be uncomfortable stay uncomfortable because this is uncomfortable this is an uncomfortable topic that we have to address if we just pretend that it doesn't exist that we just pretend that, you know, things are going to go back to normal, that things are, you know, we're going to stop talking about black lives. We're going to start focusing on playoffs and the new season and, you know, just let this moment pass. Nothing is going to change. So the resources need to be put in like uh, the idea, Joel, that you had that, um, you know, players should have some racism training alongside media training. 
that's amazing. That's a wonderful idea. I would love to see something like that on an annual basis at the beginning of the season. Let's just touch up on what racism in hockey looks like and how we're going to, as allies, avoid it. Um, call it out when we see it. I think that's so, such an, an exciting idea uh, to to continue on that education, utilizing some of those resources, not only to hire people of color and from minority communities and Black women, but also education, education, education. It's so important. We are, like Blake was saying, you know, we are not historians. We're just putting in the work. We're reading. We're taking the time to ask questions and to educate ourselves. Everyone here knows our history. And now we have to take that information and facilitate some sort of a change in this wonderful, amazing sport that we all love. Yeah, I love that. And as we, um, we're going to go around the horn again, and I'm going to try and bring two of these questions together, one being um, what are some resources that we recommend or follows? I think we've hit on some of that, but more specifically, you know, what, what anti-racist actions should white players, was, is the, how the question was phrased, um, what, what can they do publicly, not just the statements? There was also a question asking specifically, and, and Joel, you mentioned this at the highest level. So what can USA Hockey and Hockey Canada do? So the way I want to kind of put all of those together is by first asking, um, you know, what, what would we like to see? Um, and each individual can answer this. We'll go alpha order by first name. Um, you know, what would you like to see or what would you offer to um, – to players who don't identify as color uh, of things that they can do. Um, and then um, also I want to ask, what are you committed to doing um, in for communities that maybe you're, you're still learning about or that you don't identify as? And actually I'll start. So one resource I always like to offer is Better Allies. And they um, have a really great infographic that I've shared, but it's five things allies can do to sponsor. And they talk about coworkers from underrepresented groups. One of the things is just to speak their name when they're not around, endorse them, um, give them assignments that allow them to grow, um, and invite them to meetings with people in power. Um, and so, Ao, you're up next. Again, the question is, you know, what are some things that you'd like to um, challenge white allies to focus on? But then also, how would you like to challenge yourself moving forward? Um, one of the big things that I would say, I don't really have a resource that I would say, but one of the big things is just teaching people from the beginning, like Joel said, like just before the season starts, having a diversity talk. I actually emailed Kim Davis about that just to try to get a little leeway on that to try to get that going but um one of the big things that i feel that our allies could do is this could even go back to the george floyd situation you can speak up you can say something if something happens there were four cops and none of them did anything like that it happens all the time from getting called the n-word on the ice and everyone just looking at you like what are you gonna do instead of me having to do something talk to the kid tell the kid that's unacceptable like there's so many different things. And my big thing is I don't like, um, let me, let me try to phrase this right. I don't like having to teach people through, what would the word be? Um, here, I'm gonna phrase this a different way. I would rather educate people than have them go through some sort of reflection where they lose something. Do you get what I'm saying? Like, instead of, me going to tell the rep, hey, he called me the N-word, and he's suspended for five games. He doesn't understand why he's suspended for five games. Instead of sitting down with him and saying, this is unacceptable, you need to understand that I'm a person too, I'm a human, that's not acceptable. So I don't, that would be my two cents, I'm sorry. Right, so really kind of tackling it, being more proactive and not just waiting to figure out a way to react, but have things in place and, and be able to open. I hear you saying at least, Io, that you want to be open to having those conversations and have a mechanism to have those conversations. Definitely. Just don't be afraid to have the conversation. Some people are afraid to speak up because they won't be accepted or everyone else is doing it. You can be the one person that speaks up and changes everything. And again, just are, are there ways that you want to be able to practice that yourself? Um, 
more than anything, I use my social media to do that. I'll highlight people who go out on a limb and do stuff that they're not supposed to do. I know that's not always the right thing to do, but it's how you speak up and it's how you educate people that it's still out there and there's different ways to handle it than to go out and be harsh and rash about it. B for Blake Bolden. I really think that Io said some really great stuff. Um, we've had this discussion, Erica, where you're in the locker room and someone says something inappropriate, microaggression, whatever that may be, and you're sitting there like, everyone's staring at you like, whoa, whoa, whoa that was kind of awkward. What are you going to do? What are you going to say? So creating allyship, we've, we've said it a million times within the locker room, your teammates in the community, when you walk inside the rink, making hockey in the rinks a safe space. Um, my mother... Um, didn't really want to hang out in the ice rink. She didn't really want to hang out with all the other parents because they would say crazy things. So creating that safe space, understanding what's going on, um, not having to be the black person that's like, hey, that's not cool, that hurt my feelings. So it's like, let's all be teammates here. You're my teammate. I would block a shot for you, so you better stand up if someone says some ish to me. Um, for me, um, again, I think that I'm just going to be more comfortable in, in, in talking about these issues. I'm not going to be quiet anymore. And I will be better at that because I have muted myself. And it doesn't feel good when you feel that you need to, that you have to do that to survive in, in a space. So no more muting, Blake Goldman. <laughs> yes, come through. I already plugged also your cookbook, Eat in Color. So also, oh, wow. I really want to. Directly to, to folks that they that they can practice allyship and be anti-racist, and then also what that looks like for you. Um, yes, I think you know I always said about you know if if you have an engagement with somebody um, and you know instead of suspending them for five games, um, you know during that five games I think you got to hold people accountable. I think you got to hold the kids accountable. They got to go through another little education. I think the parents got to get in there. And, you know, the five games is with the parents. You're going to have to serve a little uh, little education seminar as well. And I think that's going to be imperative uh, going forward. You know, I think for myself is um, I'm just not – I wasn't – I haven't been on social media guy. i got to learn to be better. Um, I don't have Instagram or anything. I have Twitter, but I should be a little bit more proactive on it, of course. But um, I tried to have daily dialogue. I think one thing with me playing, I had dialogue with my teammates. Um whether it's a whole locker room, I grab a couple guys and, you know, because I went through a lot of things that, you know, I finally kind of came through and, um, and and things that my teammates would not understand and would not, would not know. So I think for me, that's imperative. So for you guys to keep continue to have dialogue with your teammates, um, playing hockey going forward. But, um, and you know what, for me, I, I obviously got to be a little bit more proactive. I see social media is obviously a big deal to reach out a lot of people. Um, and uh, I think, you know, obviously education. Education is huge. I think educating your peers, your white friends, um, you know, that are allies, but to educate them even more to so they can spread the word and be supportive of what you're doing and what you're saying. And, and they understand where you're coming from. And, and if they really – I've read a lot of great comments, a lot of uh, a great Twitter uh, tweets, I guess, from the other players. But now it's to kind of – got to hold them accountable and to make sure that they're going to – Instead of uh, they're going to hold into action here. So see what they're going to do next. And for us and for myself, it's just to continue to have dialogue and, and, and teach and, and, and give these guys an understanding of what, what it's like. Thanks, Renee. We're going to skip to the S's. We'll get you uh, to hold it down uh, on the back end. But so, so Roya, uh, things that you'd like to add from, from what have been said about uh, what you'd like to say to whether it's white hockey players or, or fans on how to actively be anti-racist. Yeah, I think one thing that comes to mind is just um, having people look into their own racist practices and, and how racism has been taught to them um, and recognize the ways that it's wrong. Um, and then along with the education part, um, I've been through plenty of diversity and inclusion training, but I think it's all very surface level in this day and age. And I think it's, it's time that we go deeper and make the people un uncomfortable. Um, but yeah, I, I agree with what everybody else said as well. So. 
forward to having you uh, in the Jersey area soon. Sydney, um, again, thinking about uh, actively being anti-racist. And let's say we didn't get into media, we want to focus on players, but there's definitely work that has to be done in that space as well. So maybe thinking from that lens, what would you like to see happen in media and uh, how are you challenging yourself? Um, so I think it's really important um, for everyone to realize that it's not enough to say I'm not racist, but to say I'm anti-racist, which means knowing that this is the foundation, right? Our country is built on, um, most countries and communities are built on, is a very racist foundation. And to um, acknowledge that um, and be willing, I think like Soroy said, to be willing to unlearn a lot of the things that we have um, learned already, things that have become normalized. That's another issue too. A lot of racist practices are covert and normalized. And I think those are things that have to um, be unlearned. And I think specifically in the media space, I think people need to, especially white people, um, need to um, use their privilege, use the privilege that they have, use the status that they have to uplift um, and ampli amplify black voices and other voices of color. Um, you, if you, if when Black Lives Matter is happening, don't have a white male write an article about it, you know, like find, hire black people, black people and people of color and um, give them that space to talk about things that they are knowledgeable about instead of giving that space, giving that platform to someone who isn't as informed. Um, and yeah, I think, yeah, we generally like we don't need, I think a lot of people have been sympathetic. There's been a lot of white guilt. I think that's really unnecessary. I think right now education is important, but turning that education into work. Like people are doing, I'm reading this, I'm doing that, but how is it showing up in your work, in your everyday life, um, where you go to school or where you work at or in, even in your own home, um, if someone, a family member says something that isn't right, how are you actually putting in the work um, and not just being, um, not just using words. Social media is a great platform always, but I think it's really important to actually put in that work. And I don't think there's a need for any more performative activism, which I think we've seen a lot of as well. Um, people using social media to say Black Lives Matter, but then going through their everyday life and not showing that. Um, so I think those are some things that um, definitely people can use and utilize to change the culture. Um, but personally for me, I think we all sort of have um, a privilege. I think we all need to get out of our own personal perspective. Um, for me, I'm a cis hetero black woman. So a lot of the stuff that I fight for is for other black women, which is great. I think we need to help each other and amplify each other's voices and stand with each other and support each other. But also at the same time, that I know that there's a whole um, LBGTQ um, community of color that I, I am not very informed about. And I have to push myself to be more informed about and uplift them as well. You know, um, say her name doesn't just include cis hetero uh, black women, but also um, women in the LBGT um, Q uh, plus community. And I think I want to use my platform and expand my platform to uplift all women of color. <laughs> Thank you, Sydney. And you made me realize, uh, one, that I didn't answer the second part of my own question. And, but that is, is exactly what also I'd like to commit to, even realizing that when I'm, I'm putting out uh, content or even the amazing conversations that I've been able to have with a lot of the panelists here, am I making that um, accessible in all ways uh, by adding captions or, again, thinking that I, I come from a place of privilege in a lot of ways that I identify. So how can I learn more and then everyone's point, you know, take the knowledge that I've gained and make changes in how I present uh, on the media side, um, how I'm presenting information on the media side. So I appreciate that. Renee, though, you have brought all of us together by the work that you are doing. Um, we want to um, close this out shortly, but not before we are able to um, turn over the floor to you. Uh, so thank you for bringing us all together. And we're going to give the mic back to Renee Hess. 
This has been such a great conversation, and I've really enjoyed hearing what everyone has to say about you know this topic, about race and hockey, and what y'all are doing in your own communities. I, you know, I don't want to preach to the choir. I know that we're all on the same page here when we say, you know, amplify Black voices, um, use your platforms, uh, you know, be as inclusive of all communities as we can, um, because that those those things ring true uh, across, you know, across um, for all of us. I have included um, a link in the YouTube chat to some of the action points that I talked about with Soroya when we had our Instagram live a couple weeks ago. Um, and so those that is probably where I stand in terms of you know what I think we should be doing in our com in our community uh, and what you know non-black people as well as black people can be doing. Uh, Sydney, you talked to, about um, self-care for the black community, and I really do think that's important. Uh, we uh, collectively are experiencing trauma at all times when it comes to racism. And so, you know, I definitely encourage everyone that I speak with, especially in the last couple weeks, just to, you know, take care of yourself uh, as, a, as a black person, communicate with one another, understand that there is a community here with Black Girl Hockey Club uh, for you to have a safe space to address some of these things that we've been talking about. Um, it's acceptable here to talk about race and to talk about the, the things that are troubling us in our society, because if we're not talking about it, who's going to, right? Um, I would definitely say that for allies, we want you to continue to educate yourselves. Um, don't put it on the only black person in the room to be the one to speak up because it is, for a variety of reasons, some, we cannot always speak up because it is not always acceptable when you're sitting around the boardroom uh, to, to speak up and defend yourself against microaggressions. A, a good ally is going to step in and say that's unacceptable. Um, you, as a non-Black person working in hockey, whether it's in hockey media or um, one of the, the larger organizations or even, you know, a small a city club, you got to realize that your organization is steeped in a history of anti-racist practices. It doesn't matter if you, you know, your knee-jerk reaction is to say, I'm not racist. You need to, you need to really think about why that is. Um, and why, instead of listening to your your black friends and and your black peers, that your your initial reaction is to defend yourself and to defend your institution, um, because all of our institutions are steeped in anti-black practices. So so examining that, understanding why that is, where that comes from, and then what you can do to um, subvert that is going to be the key to allies um, helping out their, their minority um, and um, marginalized communities. Um, conversations like this are great. Uh, you know, right now we have an all black panel. And so, you know, we can just like relax a little bit, chill a little bit and, and just talk about these issues. But we also need to include our non-black brothers and sisters in this conversation as well. Um, we need to have you, our non-black allies, standing up and, and understanding that they're complicit, but that doesn't mean that you cannot make a change. And that doesn't mean that you cannot move, move this conversation forward. I, I know a lot of non-black folks are worried about hopping into this conversation. It's uncomfortable. It's confusing. They don't want to say the wrong thing. Um, they don't want to alienate their their friends and their families. But I'd say, you know, be brave. Stand up for what you know is right. Speak up when you know that it's needed. And, you know, we, we're in this together. It's, it's for the long haul. It's not a short-term um, moment, right? It's a movement. 
So uh, I, I would just, you know, encourage everyone to uh, engage uh, to the Black Girl Hockey Club website. We have a resources page. We have um, Erica's love, favorite inf infographic, uh, the authentic engagement infographic is on there uh, for how um, uh, NHL teams could authentically engage with their uh, black fans and um, audiences. There's the action points that I, I talked about. And then, you know, on social media, I would just say continue to pay attention and to listen to fans and what fans have to say because, you know, sometimes we are kind of obnoxious and we're yelling about things that make us mad or whatever, but also there is a plethora of experiences there in, in the hockey fandom. There's people that are, um, you know, in all walks of life that have important and exciting ideas to share. Um, I owe you just saying that you reached out to Kim Davis about the, the, what Joel had was talking about just, you know, warms my heart that, you, you know, you took that initiative and you had this wonderful idea and you shared it with this humongous organization hoping to see a change. I would challenge every single one of us here listening to my voice to do that in your workplaces, in your sport, uh, on your team, you know, with your friends, with your family, wherever you can, continue speaking up, continue speaking out, use your voice, use that power and know that Black Girl Hockey Club, and we're, we're here. This community is for you. This community is for us. And we're, we're here to, to make a change and to really see that happen in this amazing sport that we all love. So I'm, I'm just so glad that we could have this conversation. Um, I know we started a little bit late, but hey, we ran a little bit late too. So I feel like we, we made up for it on the, on the other end. Um, if, uh, I think that's it, guys. I think, I think we're done. I, I really enjoyed talking with everyone here. Um, please be sure to you know, follow them all on their social medias. Uh, make sure to keep an eye out for um, Soroya in the new season uh, with the ribs coming up. Hopefully, knock on wood, we get a season. Um, <laughs> be sure to keep an eye on the uh, Diversity Alliance and what they're going to be accomplishing in hockey. Um, check out Sports Disrupted, at Sports Disrupted, right, over on, on Twitter. And, um, of course, you know, I failed to mention Erica has this amazing podcast of video series that she's um, been engaging with recently, Social Justice in Women's Hockey. I mean, she's not pulling punches in just the title right there. Please go check it out. Um, and good luck to everyone here as we move forward. Io, you're going down south to play, to play hockey. Good luck to you, sir. It's going to be a challenge, but I, you're up for it. I already know, you know, and we have your back. Uh, tell your mom I said hi. <laughs> I, I know she's there. Um, that's it, guys. Thank you so much for joining us. Hopefully we'll do this again soon. I think this is such a wonderful experience. Um, everybody had such interesting things to say. I'm excited to see what we're going to be doing in the future. Uh, this uh, recording will be available on YouTube for free. Everybody who has joined us, we sold over 600 uh, free tickets. So this is some free information. If you're so inclined, you can donate to Black Girl Hockey Club over on our website or via PayPal. Um, and, you know, happy Juneteenth. Let's keep it going, guys. The work is not finished. Um, we still have a long ways to go, but together, we got this. All right, guys, have a wonderful rest of your weekend. Thanks, Renee. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye.